Hi everyone, I'm Christine. And I'm Kaden. And we're the prevention team advocates at the Spring of Tampa Bay, Hillsborough County Certified Domestic Violence Center. Since 1977, the Spring has provided a safe haven and comprehensive support services to more than 70,000 abused adults and their children. One of the Spring's many programs is our Youth Action Committee, a group of dedicated young people who work together to build healthy relationships and act as peer educators to create positive changes in their community. For the past seven years, they've put together and led our annual Teen Summit during the month of February in recognition of Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. As a response to COVID-19, the Youth Action Committee and Supporting Prevention Team are taking the opportunity to host a 100% virtual summit experience. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a collective and systemic trauma, creating barriers for all of us to live our most productive and healthy lives. For most adults, we are finding ourselves newly adjusting to living and working in the digital world. Young folks, however, have already been experts at living in this technological age. Well, we have each faced our own challenges, survivors of dating and domestic violence are facing additional unique and devastating problems to live their lives safely. Young people who may have had these close access to friends, relatives, counselors, and teachers for intervention services and social support are now finding themselves more isolated than ever. Digital abuse and isolation have long been tactics used by abusers in violent relationships. It is more important now than ever to have these discussions with young folks and to educate ourselves about red flags, safety, and tech healthy relationships with our partners. This is why we are so excited to invite everyone to our 8th Annual Teen Summit behind the screen. On the right side of the screen, you can find a list of events for Teen Summit Tuesdays. And if you have not already, please visit www.peaceandpurple.org slash teen summit to register for your free opportunity to learn more about digital abuse and teen dating violence. Until then, our Youth Action Committee members Cassidy, Haley, Olivia, Tony, Allison, and Maya have put together the following information as an introduction to the 8th Annual Teen Summit behind the screen. So, what is dating violence? Dating violence is best defined as a pattern of abusive behavior by one partner in a relationship towards the other partner in order to gain and keep power and control. Power and control are going to be the two biggest takeaways from this statement. The abuser's main goal will be to maintain this power and control. Dating violence isn't about anger. It's about one partner having too much power or control over the other. When discussing dating violence in teenagers, the power and control wheel shown here can help give us insight on how abuse can happen in these relationships. For example, the wheel goes into detail on how numerous tactics are used to gain power and control, such as intimidation, isolation, sexual coercion, peer pressure, or threats. Anyone can be a victim of dating violence, regardless of age, race, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, etc. In the United States, for example, one in three adolescents is a victim of physical, sexual, emotional, or verbal abuse from their dating partner. This statistic is much higher than that of other types of youth violence. And statistically, women between the ages of 16 and 24 will experience the highest rate of relationship violence. Additionally, LGBTQ teenagers have a higher rate of violence in relationships than their heterosexual peers. Dating violence can occur in many different ways. However, power and control remain the primary goals of the abuser in each situation. So, before we go into teen dating violence further, it's important to understand the different types of abuse that may occur. We recognize six different types of abuse, these being physical, emotional or verbal, sexual, financial, stalking, and digital. The first is physical. This is any intentional, unwanted contact with you or something close to your body, or any behavior that causes or has the intention of causing you injury, disability, or death. Examples include punching, slapping, kicking, biting, choking, or pulling hair, throwing objects at you, using weapons against you, pushing or pulling you, forcibly grabbing you, harming your children or pets, forcing you to use drugs or alcohol, or preventing you from contacting emergency services or receiving medical attention. 
It's important to remember that physical abuse does not always have to leave a bruise. The examples on this list do not include all types of physical abuse. They're common warning signs, though. The next is emotional abuse, or using verbal or nonverbal communication with intent to harm you mentally or emotionally or exert control over you. Some of these examples include calling you names or insults, telling you what to wear, yelling or screaming at you, threatening you, constantly monitoring you, or excessive texting, humiliation, intimidation, and isolation. Next is sexual abuse, which is forcing or attempting to force you to take part in a sexual act when you do not or cannot consent. Examples include unwanted kissing or touching, unwanted rough or violent sexual activity, refusing to use condoms or restricting access to birth control, or sexual contact with someone who cannot give a clear and informed consent. Sexual abuse is never the victim's fault, and just because someone didn't say no or didn't resist sexual advances does not mean that they consent. Next is financial abuse, which is extending power and control into your financial situation. Examples include giving you an allowance or monitoring what you buy, depositing your paycheck into an account you can't access, preventing you from viewing or accessing bank accounts, stealing money from you, your family, or your friends, and refusing to provide you with money, food, rent, medicine, or clothing. Financial abuse often operates in more subtle ways than other forms of abuse, but it can be just as harmful to those who experience it. Next is stalking, which is a pattern of repeated unwanted attention and contact by a partner that causes fear for your safety. Examples include showing up at your home or workplace unannounced or uninvited, sending you unwanted texts, messages, letters, emails, or voicemails, using social media or technology to track your activities, spreading rumors about you online or in person, and manipulating other people to investigate in your life. Finally, there's digital abuse, which is the use of technology in the internet to bully, harass, stalk, intimidate, or control you. In simpler terms, this characterization is often verbal or emotional abuse conducted in a virtual format. Digital abuse can take place in various settings, but here we've compiled a list of the top five approaches that abusers use in order to intimidate, control, stalk, or harass, or digitally abuse you on the internet. Number one, direct attacks. This method occurs when the abuser directly attacks, harasses, damages the property or familial or friendships of the target. Two, public attacks. These are perpetuated by the abuser where intentional malicious reputation damaging or embarrassing posts and communications are made about the target online. Three, cyberbullying by proxy. Here, the abuser manipulates others to commit public or direct attacks, privacy invasions, or posed attacks that are directly meant to hurt the target. 4. Privacy invasions. Here, these are perpetuated by the abuser and are typically characterized by the excessive monitoring of another's communications or overall activities. Even with or without permission, the excessive monitoring of someone else's communications or activities is totally wrong. Like the social distancing guidelines, make sure to keep your distance. 5. Posed attacks. Here, the abusers abuse the anonymity offered by digital technologies to steal identities or even pose as a target in some scenarios. I'm sure you can see how this is all problematic. But now that we have all of the names of all of the approaches that abusers use to digitally abuse people online, let's look at a few examples. If someone is excessively contacting another person by any means, such as emails, text messages, phone calls, you name it, what approach is the abuser using? Right, direct attacks. Unwanted excessive contacting is harassment. Okay, let's try another. If someone is being monitored by GPS, device tracking, or through social media, what approach to digital abuse is the abuser taking in this situation? If you said privacy invasions, you're right. With or without the consent of the individual being monitored in this situation is an invasion of privacy. Like I said earlier, let's try to maintain that distance. Okay, 
Last one, I promise. What if someone is threatening to send private pictures of you or your info out to the world or even sexting? What should you do? Does anyone know this one? If not, it's okay. Let's just enlighten ourselves a little bit. Did you know that if you're underage and you disperse yours or another's nudes out, that you're participating in perpetuated child pornography, which BTW is illegal? Upon first offense, you would have to pay a fine of $60 in addition to community service. If you're a teen and maybe are a minor, or maybe you're just not a teen or underage at all, and are convicted, you could face up to 15 years in prison and be required to register yourself as a sex offender. No matter what, you should be careful in the digital world. By knowing the approaches that some take to digitally abuse others online and the consequences of some acts, we hope that you'll be more cautious than ever. So now we're going to go over some of the red flags and warning signs of unhealthy relationships. One of the primary examples is that you might be in an abusive relationship if your partner is never willing to accept the blame, like if they always try to blame everything on you, or if they put you down frequently, especially in front of others in an attempt to bring down your self-worth. They might also isolate you from your friends and family, um, physically, emotionally, or financially to take down your support network. Mm -hmm. They also might be extremely jealous or insecure, like if they don't allow you to, to speak with someone of the opposite sex or accuse you of cheating if you do. And another example is if they have explosive outbursts or mood swings, such as quickly switching in between being angry and yelling and being sweet and apologetic. So another red flag that could indicate an unhealthy relationship could be if your partner physically harms you, which this is an obvious one. It includes actions such as slapping, hitting, punching, or physically restraining you. Or if they're too possessive or controlling and because they're not letting you have your own life because they see you as their property. Or, the, or the, one of the biggest ones is that they might pressure or force you into having sex because just because you are in a relationship, you do not owe anybody sex. Or they might threaten you, which this could be verbal or physical, such as if they throw an object near your head, um, and they could threaten you, your friends, your family, or even themselves. And, an and one last red flag is if they always have to be in control. Like if they require that you check in with them anytime you go somewhere, or if they have to know who you're with at all times. Now we are going to discuss some of the common warning signs of, of someone you know being in, un in an unhealthy relationship. Um, they might be in an abusive relationship if they have unexplained injuries that occur on a regular basis which they may attempt to use makeup or clothing to cover up, such as bruises or scratches, if they experience changes in appearance or body language, if they need to ask their partner's permission to do things, especially for simple things like just going out for coffee, um, if they have a drastic drop in self-esteem because their partner may be trying to lower their self-worth so they feel like they can't leave the relationship, um, if they frequently cancel plans, because this might indicate the abuser becoming too controlling over them and not allowing them to have plans with other people, or if they suddenly stop doing things or talking to friends or family because their partner may be trying to isolate them from their support network. So we've discussed some red flags and warning signs of an unhealthy relationship, but here are some that are more specific to the digital age with social media and texting. So the abuser may require that their partner turn location sharing on, or they may confiscate all of their partner's passwords for social media, and they might um, prohibit their partner from messaging or calling certain friends or family members trying to isolate them from their support network, or they might not allow their partner to post certain pictures on social media if they think that they're too revealing or inappropriate, or they might make embarrassing posts about their partner on social media in order to humiliate them and isolate them from their friends, or they might demand explicit photos or share explicit photos of the partner with other people. So what do you do if your friend is in an abusive relationship? If you think that they might be experiencing dating violence, you should talk to them about what's concerning you and be specific about your concerns. And you should listen to what they say and believe them. Don't doubt their story and make sure that you're not being judgmental and keep, make sure you keep what they say confidential. Like talk to them in private and assure them that the conversation will be kept between the two of you. In certain situations, if you believe that your friend is in serious danger, refer them to an, a safe adult. And also do not give ultimatums. Don't add any additional stress or pressure on them. So what if your friend is the abuser? 
If you believe your friend might be perpetrating dating violence, um, you need to keep in mind that the abuser is the only person who can decide to change, but there are several things that you can do to encourage them to be better. You need to be specific about their actions that you feel may be inflicting harm on their partner. Tell them what you saw, tell them why you think it was wrong, and keep the victim's feelings in mind. Tell them to um, keep the victim's point of view and perspective in mind when you're just having this conversation. Don't allow them to justify or to justify their abuse or blame their partner for anything. Take a stand and tell them that you will not allow this to happen without standing up for their partner in the situation. In either situation, whether your friend is a victim of dating violence or is perpetrating dating violence, you should always have a list of resources ready to help. There are a couple of resources you can contact if you or a friend needs help. The first is a trusted adult. This is someone at home, school, or elsewhere that you know you can talk to and trust. The second is loveisrespect.org. The third and fourth are national hotlines, the National Domestic Violence Hotline and the National Dating Abuse Hotline, which are both shown here. The fifth is the Florida Domestic Violence Hotline, which you can call, text, or use the non-emergency legal phone. You could also text love is to 22522 or use the spring crisis hotline. A huge thank you to our Youth Action Committee members for giving us an introduction to this month's events. We'd now like to introduce our keynote speaker, Morgan McAuliffe. Morgan is the Prevention Specialist with the Florida Department of Children and Families Domestic Violence Program. We've known Morgan for a few years now, and we're truly inspired by her story of youth activism and the power that one person has to make a difference. Our visions begin with desires, Audre Lorde. All grand visions begin with desires, desires such as to excel, succeed, grow, and change. At 16, I knew I had wanted change, but I wasn't quite sure what that change was. I come from a smallish town where many people I knew came from homes with all kinds of issues, like from domestic violence to drug addictions, poor or low income. Um, some of the kids I went to school with didn't eat at home, they ate at school. Um, and that was where they only got their meals from. And then some of them were placed in foster homes. There was only one high school and there would be fights that broke out every single day. Um, we had an interior commons area where everyone met. In lining the walls, there were segregated walls based on race, ethnicity, and groups like the popular kids or rednecks um, that everyone would like sit in in the mornings and even like after school or during lunches. Uh, my friends and I knew that there was something going on and that these were issues, but we didn't have the words for it. So, and at this time, it was the late 2000s. So the internet and cell phones weren't as high tech as they are now. So getting information quickly or accurately wasn't a thing. Then at this time, we started to reach out to each other, other young people like ourselves, like having conversations and adults. We wanted to we wanted to change things. We wanted the violence to stop and we knew we needed to start somewhere. Um, at this time I was connected to the local domestic violence center in our area and I had started volunteering for community service hours. And at that time I found out that they had people who specifically worked with young people to create change in their communities. Simultaneously, Making that connection, we had started something called the Youth Community Action Team at our school. We started planning leadership training for ourselves about healthy relationships, oppression, gender norms, leadership, and organizational change. In that same summer, we had a leadership retreat that was housed in our town city hall. After that, we planned what we wanted to accomplish for the next year and our focus. In our first year, we decided that focusing on healthy relationships was our first step. 
it was a huge issue in our school and we saw many unhealthy and toxic, toxic relationships, even among our friends. We did things like awareness events, we did campaigns, and we even started working on a website to share what we were doing. And I continued to be a large part of the youth community action team until I graduated. And then I started volunteering at the, um, volunteering my time on the local community action team at that same center. Um, and then a few years later, a position opened up at that center that specifically worked with young people collaborating and mobilizing for change in their communities. I had applied for the position and they offered me the job. Um, I continued to work with young people for most of my time at the center in that capacity, like at the youth community action team, mobilizing for change, and as well as working with young people who had seen things in their homes. Um, I engaged in more awareness projects at that time, creating and co-facilitating training with young people and coordinating events with young people. I have traveled around Florida and even another state educating other adults about the importance of working with young people and truly listening and understanding that you all know what is best and needed in your schools and your communities. Most importantly, that you can make change in your communities and your own lives. Now, I no longer work at that local center. I work at the state helping others at centers work with you and in your communities to work together to create that necessary change and knowledge to do so. When I was younger, I had no idea that what I spent a lot of my free time on in high school could be a job or even a career, but here I am 13 years later and continue to do just that. It all starts with a desire then that desire becomes a vision and you can accomplish those visions. I hope that today your desires will become visions and that you will gain the necessary tools to turn those visions into action. Thank you, Morgan, for sharing your story with us. We hope you can hear Morgan's story and feel encouraged to take action on your visions. It may feel like the world is against you or that creating change is too big a task, but your dreams and interests have always had the ability to grow into actions that can create a better and safer community for all. If you are inspired by the information that you heard today or are looking for a more in-depth conversation about digital abuse and dating violence, please be sure to register for our eighth annual Teen Summit behind the screen. We'll see you soon.